A good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. A warm welcome and hello from the University of West Indies Cave Hill campus here in, I was about to say Dr. Corbin, sunny Barbados, but we are about to see the sunset over the campus. Uh, so we are delighted that you were able to join us this evening for our information session on our two programs, Labor and Employment Relations and Human Resource Management. For those, we always assume that our participants know about us, but a little spiel uh, to, about the University of the West Indies. We are the premier tertiary institution in the region and have been ranked externally among the top 2.5% of universities worldwide. So we are holding our own and we are very proud of that acknowledgement. We are also, um, the School of Business and Management is also under the umbrella of the vision of the university. So one of the things that we actually pride ourselves in is delivering programs where you are, where we can recognize that we are globally excellent and relevant, my, praise, my bracket, but deeply rooted in the Caribbean. We are deeply, deeply committed to the human resource development of the region. And no matter where, which ends of the earth you therefore find yourself after you've been with us, you can hold your own, but still have a sense of value and a sense of the knowledge, competences, and skills that address the problems of the region, building solutions for the region, which are portable anywhere else. So even though the programs, as you will hear this evening, can be rigorous, they are, once you're finished the programs, you can be anywhere no matter where in the world you are. So as I said today, oh, who am I? I'm Sonia Mohan, I'm my colleague, the coordinator of these programs, Dr. Corbin is who's gonna be taking you through the session for the information on these two programs in particular this evening. And I will be his, I will be the moderator. So as we get into the Q and A session and so on, I will just moderate from the questions that you have directly back to Dr. Corbin and anything then Dr. Corbin, that you want me to weigh in on, I certainly can do so as well. Uh, you'll see me posting some notes in the chat and uh, later on in the Q&A session, if you want to engage with us orally, you just have to click raise hand and we will unmute your mic. Just so that we, I mean, we'll unmute your mic so that you can speak or engage with us orally. So there'll be a number of ways to do that. So Dr. Corbin, coordinator of the program, I'm gonna turn the session over to you. You're muted, Dr. C. My apologies. Thank you, my colleague, Ms. Mahon. Thank you for such an exciting introduction. And one of the things I first want to reiterate is that what um, she mentioned, we have a, I call it a Caribbean orientation and flavor with an international context, right? So that as practitioners in the Caribbean, you understand the realities of the, of the Caribbean context and businesses but at the same time, we teach at a level that internationally, and when I speak about SHRM, you'll be able to understand what we are saying. So let me share my screen. So again, thank you for checking in and we hope you will make the wise decision to choose, as my colleague said, one of the internationally top internationally accredited and recognized institutions, the University of the West Indies with our various campuses, and particularly the KFL campus and the KFL School of Business and Management. Uh, so first, what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at the HRM program. And then secondly, we will switch and look at the MSc Labor and Employment Relations. And, uh, and we'll give you some details on the structure of those programs. So in summary, what I can say, what we do we balance what we call theory as the foundation to these various courses taught within the program. And we balance that with practical relevance because a lot of our um, teaching approaches involve a case-based methodology and some real life cases, international cases, which should give you the opportunity, we call it an abstraction of reality. So we're able to look at a, a, a real business analyze it and break it down to get a deeper understanding of some of the concepts that would be relevant. So as uh, my colleague said, I'm a Kentel of Corbin and uh, I'm what we call, um, I'm a practitioner, a practitioner turned academic. 
And there's a term I use uh, in recent times called, uh, I'll call myself a pracademic. And a pracademic is somebody who is an academic, but also a practitioner being able to balance and my background and, and the number of my colleagues in the who teach in the programs, both programs, they are practitioners who, uh, who also um, became academics and to give examples of um, Dr. Jasmine Bab, um, who worked in government. She's currently working for an international agency um, in the Caribbean, the Caribbean as a senior HR person and um, Dr. Lane, Kathy Lane, who also is a practitioner turned consultant and also um, an academic and myself, similar thing practitioner working in government, private sector, my own business, and, and then becoming an academic. So that's the kind of value. And then we have these strong academics, very bright, intelligent, uh, cutting edge researchers. We have Dr. Dion Greenish, Dr. Dwayne Devonish. I mean, really excellent um, academics that understand it. they have been involved in major projects, international projects. So they also bring that, that, that international understanding and a wealth of competency so we can offer rich um, teaching and learning. And the other thing, I think my colleague Sona is sure she would agree. I also need to mention folks, it's a requirement at our campus and the university as a whole for all academics who will get full-time contracts to become permanent. There is a course, what we call it, um, a course in university teaching and learning. So this is a compulsory course that runs over a year and a half to two, and it really gives us skills and techniques to be better teachers, better facilitators, so we can increase the learning and your ability to, uh, to facilitate and assist you in um, doing well in the various courses. All right, so that foundational stuff, let's look at the HR program. And again, up front, I will say to you that the Society for Human Resource Management and um, you can, there's an acronym SHRM. Um, so for those participating, you can, if you want to Google now, you can Google SHRM and it's the leading HR professional institution in the world. Um, the full name is the Society for Human Resource Management. And they normally would hold a conference around May and sometime between 10 to 15,000 um, participants within um, that conference. And the who was who, who of who in the HR practice will be present. Um, a lot of um, leading businesses and executives also attend. So why I'm mentioning that, that we were able some years ago for our HR master's program, we were able to achieve certification by Sherman. It was a rigorous process there we had to present our course our courses within the, the sd um, hrm program and they critically reviewed the, the various courses that we had and then they were able to give us critical feedback so we had to enhance some of our courses we also had um, to add we also had to add certain courses to ensure that we met their high international standards and sherm offers professional certification for HR practitioners and, um, and the certification is recognized internationally. And so we have been given certification and it is renewed, which we need to continuously upgrade our program. The other part of that, I see somebody's hand up and we'll come to you shortly. The other part of that, that as a result of us having this certification and approval of our program, there's, a, there's a, a set of final exams for you to be given the professional HR designation. And because we have been certified, once you have successfully completed your master's degree, you are exempted from all of the compulsory required courses for the Sherm International Certification and you will just have to register for the exam. Um, we were trying to negotiate that we could actually conduct the exam within the Clearfield campus. But at this time, according to their regulations and guidelines, they wouldn't allow us to be able to do that, but it's something we will continue pushing for. So I reiterate, once you complete our program, you will, be get, you will get exemptions um, from all of the required courses and you will just have to do the final 
um, exams. Um, Sonia, I don't know if you can take the question. I saw somebody's hand that was up. Hi, Dr. Rainey. Yes, we can uh, do that after you get a little further in the okay. right, presentation, beautiful. and then we will invite Great them pressure. to engage beautiful. with us. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. So let's look so at Raquel. The I'm sorry, Dr. Corbin, not to cross you there. So Raquel, we I note your hand is up, and you'll be first once we take that break yes, after yes. Dr. Corbin goes through a little lower material. Right. Right. So we cater again to people who are working. Thanks for that, Sonia. So we have the, well, I'll give you the full-time structure. It's the same courses, but just broken down differently. So once you are a full-time student in the first year, semester one, right, which is this one, you will be required to do um, a course in human resource management, another specialized course in human resource development. You would also re be required to do strategic human resource management, recruitment and selection will be the ne next course and finally leadership and organizational behavior will be the fifth course so you realize you would have five courses to do and in the second semester of your first year you will have the accounted for managerial decision making you would also have contemporary industrial relations practice, compensation management, performance management, and Caribbean and international labor law. And uh, to wrap up, you will have in your first year, you would have a, 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 two summer courses, sorry, um, one in strategic planning and management, and the second research, research method for business and social sciences. And this one in research methods is important because you, um, once you choose to do the research paper as one of your final assessments, that would give you the necessary skills and competencies to do that to the required standard. And in your second year, where you're wrapping up full-time students, <coughs> excuse me, you, can, you will have one more course in semester one, occupational safety and health, and in light of COVID and other issues of wellness and work-life balance, this is a very critical course that I know Sherm pays particular attention to. And then you will have either the research paper or a practicum. And the practicum is you choose an organization, we agree, and you go within an organization where for a period of averaging three months, you will um, be uh, performing the role and uh, specific targets will be set. And uh, it is done in collaboration with the business. So we will be in contact with the HR director or manager, and we come to an agreement. What particular HR activities you will be involved in and that and at the end of it the the business would do an assessment and we give them a, a set of, of criteria to be rated so the the company the HR persons you'll be assigned to will do an assessment of you and then I would also in collaboration with the person sign off on that if it is a research paper it's um specific requirements well, a re research with, and within the company, and that is pretty comprehensive research. Now, there are three workshops occurred, and generally we like to do them early, early in the um, new year, around January, late January, and it's skills for human resource management, corporate communications, and HR information systems, and these are workshops. And if you're part-time, same courses, but only in your first year, you do three courses, and your, um, in your first semester of your first year, in second semester of your first year, you also do three courses. Summer, you do two. And in your second year, you will do in your first semester, three courses. And in the second semester, you will do two courses. And then you will have the option of the research paper or the practicum. And also the research, you will have the skills workshop. And for the MSc Labor and Employment Relations, this one was designed in collaboration with, I know, the practitioners in industrial relations. I know the unions, the major unions in Barbados would have been involved. And, uh, and us as the, 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 the core faculty within, at that time, the Department of Management and Faculty of Social Sciences. And for this one, in the first year of the labor and employment relations, you will have labor history. It will be important to know your labor history. 
Um, secondly, you would have collective bargaining and disputes resolutions. So if you're a labor officer, or if you intend to be a labor officer or in HR, you want to be the industrial relations manager, especially if this master's degree would be an ideal um, um, course for you. So if you know any of your colleagues or friends who are currently in um, their industrial relations practitioners, they're involved in labor management, um, they work at the labor department or intend to shift in any area like that, you'll need to tell them about our program. So up front, you have research methods for business, um, which should be um, three courses in your first semester of first year. And in your second semester of your first year, you will have compensation management, dealing with issues of compensation, employment and rela employment relations in a global environment. And as um, my colleague Sonia Mahon said, we try to have a Caribbean flavor, but still appreciate the international context. And uh, finally, the third course in your second semester, first year will be public sector employment relations. And in this, we try to, even in the HR program, even though it's not explicitly stated, we try to cater to persons who work um, not only in the private sector, but persons in the public sector, because we know throughout the region and in the world, um, the, there's an appreciation um, that it is not only the private sector that needs to be competitive and needs to be high performing, but also there's a movement in public sectors to also have good HR practice and to focus on performance and monitoring performance and achieving excellence and even national competitiveness. And in your semester three, which is summer, you will have one course, labor economics. And uh, in your second year, you will have three courses, occupational safety and health. And like in HR, as I said before, um, there's a, a thinking and many companies across the world and in the Caribbean have recognized the importance of health and safety and particularly the, the non-physical aspect of it and looking at mental health, psychological health and wellness and work-life balance. So you do not work in an environment that, that makes you even psychologically or emotionally ill. And uh, second, international labor law, you bring in the international flavor again and um, contemporary issues and employment policy. And also we'll be looking at local acts, regional, regional laws. In fact, I did a session in my HR, one of my HR lectures, and uh, we looked at um, labor legislation in different countries and to see the similarities and how they're complementary and, and various issues dealt with. And um, so this will be, oh, oh, finally, and then the, in the second semester, of your second year, you will have, like in the case of the HRM program, you have a practicum, which as I said, you actually go within an organization and be agree to what areas you will be um, assigned to and particular goals to be achieved and uh, a research paper and, or you will have um, to approve alternative electives. Okay? And that is the, that um, in um, giving you a bird's eye view of the various programs and I'm sure we will have the give you um, for those interested we will be able to share the, the, the um, these brochures with you um, and also as I said we are encouraging you some persons who might not have, be able to come to this session this evening you can still share with your friends or colleagues who are involved or might find it interesting Right. So I think what we can do now, Ms. Mahan, I think we can open up for questions. And if there's anything, I can just go back to any aspect of the slide if anybody wanted any clarity. Okay, certainly, Dr. Corbin. Raquel, are you used, were your, was your question answered? Um, uh, my mouse is playing with me at the moment. So okay. I'll just allow you to talk. Yes, no problem. Make sure that you can do that. And uh, Shelly as well. Raquel? Okay, I'm not. S yes, there we go. And ask to unmute. So we're willing to take your question. 
Life? Yes, yes, my question was answered. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. And Shelly. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> All right, so I have two, I actually have three questions. So I was looking at, I just finished the executive diploma in HR management. Yes. And when I looked at the HRM and HRD on this course, how different are they from the HR human resources management and human resources development that I would have done in that course? Are there any exemptions? That's question one. Um, the the SHRM exams, uh, Mr. Corbin, Dr. Corbin. Mm -hmm. The, because I just attended a seminar and they outlined the cost and everything of the entire thing. But if you do this program, you just have to do an exam with them. What's the relative cost of the exam, if you know that? Um, I mean the SHRM exams? Yes. But, but, I, but you know, COVID caused everything, the price of almost everything in the U.S. to go up. So I am so not okay. aware. I know... I know for sure the courses used to be around three, four thousand. They were pretty so the, expensive. The entire course. course now is about nine thousand, eh? US? <laughs> I yeah. think it worked out. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah nine, about nine thousand. Because I know I know prices have been changing recently, but I'm not but there's something we can check. I'm not sure what it is currently. Yes. Okay. So the first question yeah. I asked if you have an answer for that. Which is that? That's the courses from the EDM that they would have oh, done. Oh, yes, yes. EDM. Right. Um, well, I, what I would and say I, to you, the debt. And I can weigh in there if you want, Dr. Corbin. Yeah, Go I can ahead, say, Ms. Mahan, thank you. In term, well, I can say in terms of what we do, the debt at the market, master's level would mm -hmm. be much at a much greater level. And the assessment. Not different. Right. You see, the, the assessment, because as I, I normally tell students, um, you might not be aware, but there's actually... Um, a, 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 an educator called um, Bloom, and he developed a taxonomy, which is a way of measuring assessments. Taxonomy, so, yes. Yes, so you're already taught. So you could have uh, questions that are easy, questions that are moderate and a little more difficult. So in fact, mm -hmm. recently, I, I am actually a second assessor for those programs in the, in the, uh, in the, the diploma course you spoke about. So mm -hmm. what I do as a second assessor I look to achieve, to determine, okay, this is not a master's, this is an, a, an executive diploma program. So I look at the depth of the question and, and in that taxonomy, uh, so if I find the examiner is going too deep where you're branching into a master's program, that's very moderate to say, look, you, know, you, you must assess students at the level at which um, the course is intended, you see? Um, but obviously, I know sometimes in teaching, you know, sometimes lecturers might, might extend the scope a bit. But in terms of the, the, the official part of it, the, the courses are intended, intended to be distinct. And one is a foundation to the other one. You see? Okay. So be and the, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I understand. Thanks. Um, yeah. There was just one thing further because I had applied online for the Master's in Human Resources Management. Right. And then... I tried to get back into it to pay the application registration fee. I couldn't. And I also was a little confused because I didn't receive a specific, any specific direction in terms of where, what paperwork needed to be submitted. Sonia, that's for you. Okay. So in terms of, well, I'm going to, I'm going to bounce it back to you in a moment, but Shelly, if you, is that a recent application? within yeah, for this is. for this upcoming period if you yeah, don't so did it last here, week okay if you don't yes yeah, so it's quite possible that it hasn't been um, processed as yet or the processing of your application hasn't begun as yet when i, when but, I looked online at my profile it said processed but because you can tr you can track it huh right but if you don't mind sharing your information with us um we are going to damien or mr small could you put the we're going to do this a little later but we are going to share the email addresses or the email address and so on that you can and this is for everybody who wants to follow with other information uh, that we that you want clarity on or you didn't see presented today or to interact with us for any reason um please mm -hmm. do so but if you can send an email uh shelly we will follow up with that for you to see what's going on with your application i would appreciate that very much you're welcome. 
And um, Dr. Corbin, I said I was going to, in, in tennis terms, so I'm lob the ball back to you. No in, problem. Uh, the matriculation to get into the program because I'm seeing some questions coming out, coming out about that. And it really is a good segue from the last question that Shelly asked. So thank you so much, Shelly. Unless there was another one that you... Um, well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'll get some more answers as the time goes by. Okay. But, well, we require a, a, a first degree, but I think when we did the last session, there is provision made for adults, adults who have a body of experience that you worked in the labor department, and you might not necessarily have a degree, but you worked in the labor department for an extended time or an, an IR, you worked at a union. So the university also considers mature student entry. And, um, and in any case, the, there is a, a, we have a committee approach that once you apply, the committee will review your application. And, um, and in the case, if it's an adult entry, they will look and um, it might require additional information from you if it is necessary. So I would suggest in that case, once you know you have a body of experience, you work in the area for a number of years as a proven track record, if you can actually prepare a little dossier of the things that you would have done mm -hmm. and activities, and that would actually add some value to, these, to the, um, the, the assessment process and the recommendation then that would go forward uh, with the possibility of you being able to get entry, even though you might not have a first degree. Right. And, and if I can just... Where do I submit that? Where do I submit that? When and how? Yes, Sonia, go ahead. Right. So I was saying that for there are different, there are different pathways to the graduate program. The traditional pathway, of course, is to have typically an honors first degree. And you don't have to have a first degree in HR or any specific um, certification or any specific discipline. You can come in. Uh, what we for those who are were career oriented first, and you went into your careers, as Dr. Corbin said, and you may have done um, industry level certification or technical certificates and yes. so on. And yeah. you have been in a management maybe for an extended period of time. The, it is important that you prepare and submit a detailed CV and there is an interview process for candidates with that kind of profile. So it's not a no. Um, we really do welcome that diversity within the classroom or the course environment, but we also want to make sure, especially if you've been out of academia for an extended period of time, that you are not taking on more than you can manage. Yeah. We really want to partner with you through to your successful completion of the program. And it does almost like exercise. You do have to get back into that mindset and create that space to come back into formal academia. So that if you have a non-traditional, non-academic traditional um, profile, please don't hesitate, but in order for us to review you mm -hmm. on a case by case basis, because everybody's case is different. There may be nuances yeah. for one person that yeah. even on the surface, two candidates look exactly the same. By the time we drill down, we look and examine your CV, we realize there are nuances. So the way to get this started is to, uh, to apply, to submit the application. Yeah, Sandy, I'm seeing in the chat, someone is saying that they, did it similar to what we are saying, but they did not receive a response. I don't know, was that if the person, That's, if you can't talk, if you can write, was that a recent thing or was that sometime in past? Right, and Damien and um, that's Marcia and Shelly, I noted your name. And again, we're gonna post the email addresses just so that we can follow up with you to make sure that we were, you're not lost somewhere in the system. And I see Gloria is asking, um, Sonia also, the, are there courses offered exclusively online? I don't. So the well, delivery, yep. Well, well, I mean, COVID put everything online in total, but I think we are, we are actually migrating back to face to face, but our program, I wouldn't say our program is a full, to Sonia is correct, right? We don't have a full online program other than what we did for COVID. Would that be correct in saying that? So it depends on the program. So for example, the labor and employment relations program is, I think all the courses are offered online, exclusively online, but for the HRM, some of the courses may be offered in the high, high flex format. So let me explain right. what that means. For many, for many of the courses, students can opt to either come to class face-to-face -face, or they can opt to follow the class synchronously online, which is 
or a, even asynchronously. So what that means is that you're sitting in the classroom. Uh, this would be done in the graduate studies building, um, Dr. Corbin, and we are outfitting some of the right. some of the classrooms right. in the School of Business and Management as well. So imagine that you are not in Barbados, you're not physically here, or you're in Barbados, but you just can't get to class for a period of time because of your work involvement but you, off, you still want to really engage in the class, you can stay in your office, you can stay in any jurisdiction that you're in and join the class synchronously. The, you are actually engaging as though you were physically in the classroom. So that's what we're calling the hyperflex model where you are, you are joining the class according to the schedule timetable and engaging with your contemporaries, with your cohort as though you were sitting in the classroom. Those sessions are also recorded, so recorded and available for a limited time. We want to discourage the binge watching, which started to develop uh, in the early days when we went to emergency remote teaching and I put everything online. We want to discourage that. So the recordings are available for a limited time, but allows you to, if you cannot make a session at the scheduled time and most of our, our offerings at the graduate level begin earliest, they begin is at five o'clock and usually it's from five to eight or six to nine in the evening, according to the timetable. And therefore, there, there may be times you just can't make that synchronously. You can watch the recordings and engage after the fact asynchronously as well, but for a limited time as well. So if even if you are not physically on island or you are on island but can't get physically to the classroom, you can certainly engage with us online. So those are the HR program the MSc in HR management is hybrid, whereas labor and employment relations, all those courses are delivered online. 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 We do have two questions. Uh, one was in the chat about <laughs> SHRM. Um, let me see if I can. Which is that? Which is that? Right, Juliet. Juliet asked us that she's scheduled to sit the SHRM exam in July. And do we offer any assistance in preparing someone for this exam? Um, I'm smiling at the question because I almost anticipate what you're going to say. Well, well, I don't think it is a formal system in place currently, but I believe that if you, if you needed assistance, it's something that if you reach out. So what I would suggest is, Jul is Juliet or Juliet? I saw Juliet. Juliet, right, Juliet. So what you can do, what I suggest you do, if um, I think if you can contact um, Damon, they do, I think Damon just put an email in there, right? Graduate KFS School of Business and Management. So what I suggest you do, Juliet, just, just reach out, mention my name, and then we can have, I can have a conversation with you. And, um, and then we can see, you know, what, what might be possible. Okay. And ideally that's the purpose of the program as Dr. Corbin would have spoken before, you're doing the courses so that you can then, um, you can then sit the SHRM exam without, yeah. I think, having to do the Correct. SHRM courses because we are aligned with their, with their courses. So once you go through the HR program, you are in a good position prepared to sit the SHRM yeah. exam. So that is the sort of support that we give the in-course, the continuation, of, of registering and continuing on with the courses in the program which are developed for that very reason. So you do have a choice once you're finished the MSc HRM, you don't have to go through the SHRM exam, but you certainly have the body of knowledge that you would need in order to be, to successfully um, complete that exam. So in some form, um, God, you, need encourage, you need to encourage your colleagues to do as, as uh, my colleagues said, you know, enroll in our program, encourage your colleagues too. And uh, we would make sure the preparation, as Sonia said, for the exams would be something that, you know, would be all part of our, our assistance to you. And, uh, but we, we are inclusive and we, we are here to serve and we want you to tell everybody about our program and as they said, we have an excellent faculty of dedicated persons. Um, once you're part of our program, our goal is to make sure you can achieve your career goals. Okay, some other questions here, Dr. Corman. Yes. Um, is, is there a particular benefit of choosing the practicum over the research paper or vice versa for students that's, who yeah, are that's that, Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. What I would say is that the 
Um, it depends on your strength, one. It depends on your strength. Um, and it depends on your, if you're working full-time and you have big commitments. Because if you're working full-time, and some people might be very senior officers, so if you're a very senior person already and you're just doing this, like the second master's you're doing, um, you might not be able to get the time to do a practicum because in a practicum, it's three months dedicated actually working within an HR environment. So we generally, you would find persons who don't have a body of experience in HR, but they have done an HR master's. So the practicum is intended for you to, be, to go actually within an HR department, whether public, private, or NGO, and you can then practice the skills. And as I said, you'll be working with the, one of the HR managers or officers, and it is, like you're having a, a job assignment for three months now it, the, so uh, so that's the the situation in which um most people will choose the practicum um, so if some people i'm aware they actually have jobs but they're able they were able to negotiate with their employers to take leave for a period of time maybe three months or so that they will take leave they will do the practicum even in another organization or there might be an organization A, whether private, public, they are not in HR, so they will get approval from their um, boss or their senior manager to be assigned to HR for three months. So the practicum can be done within your organization if you're not within HR. So I would recommend finally, if you are currently working in HR and you're just getting the masters to add more value to your career opportunities and growth, um, the, you're already in the HR, so the practicum might not make any significant difference for you. And hence the research paper where we would advise you and the research papers are generally applied research where you actually would choose an organization. So you can choose your organization, particular set of HR issues or issue or any other organization. So in that sense, you'll be able to do a really strong research Pro, um, uh, paper and solve a problem for your organization or some other organization. And maybe one thing, Sony, I'm sure we normally encourage students to develop high quality output because the university has put research at the forefront of one of the things in the forefront of its growth and international accreditation. So it's also the potential if you really do a, an excellent research paper. It, there's a potential it could be taken to the next level to be published, and that has happened in past across different faculties where students can actually publish with their, their, um, their, their lectures. Or you, it might even allow you to realize you have research capabilities, and hence you could actually now go to the next level where you might determine to do uh, or DBA or you might be, um, want to do a, a PhD. And um, you, you never know, Sonia, they might actually become one of the lecturers of the future, uh, making a contribution and becoming a, what, one of the academics. then, you're actually somebody who was a practitioner, um, and which is what, in my case, you know, somebody who would have been um, working full-time in HR, and teaching part-time at UV, and then, you know, moving to become a full-time academic. Okay, so while I'll answer this question that's in the chat, I'm going to ask you again to add, I'm going to ask you to answer, can somebody accelerate the completion of the program so that you spoke about the part-time um, yeah. progress through the program, for example, the HRM, but what's the shortest time frame that a student can complete if they're engaged, if they're with us full-time? Right, well, the, that'll be just over a year and a half, mm -hmm. see it in the program, just about a year and a half until, because I mean the programs, because we have international accreditation and we are sure, you know, there's a particular requirement and a, and a rigor that is required. So you don't want to put yourself um, under undue stress, and then you know there are consequences. We like you know work life balance or study life balance it, um, would be very important. So what we have here is tight. Five courses a semester. There's a lot of courses in a master's program and the, and the, the kind of standards we must maintain uh, to be internationally accredited and certified through SHRM, you see. So, so if you are full time, the just about a year and a half and you will be out uh, um, of the system. And um, so that's the, the shortest time to do six on. I don't know if you're a revenue student. Um, no, so I, I was. I was waiting for you to finish so that we can make this realistic. If you are working 
Even if you're working part-time, if you are working or you have commitments like family and so on outside of the university, uh, doing a full-time load is a tremendous, it's tremendously heavy. And we do not advise a person working full-time to take a full-time load. Um, yeah. You are, even though the, on, on, on paper, on the timetable, it looks similar to what you would have done at, at, at undergrad. The depth of what you need to, yeah, that you're going yeah. to be engaging with and the assessments that you're going to be engaging with, this is not, it's not going to be sustainable for an extended period of time. So yeah. if you are working full time, the, in order to, again, for us to support you through to completion, to successful completion of the program, we would not encourage you're doing more than three courses per semester and you're still going to be finished within the 24 months. You're going to be finished just over yeah. 24 months as well. So you really want to, to progress at a pace that is sustainable and allows you to achieve your ultimate objective, which is to successfully yeah. complete the program as well. Yeah. Yeah. And once it's part time, two years, just about two years. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then for each of these courses, they're going to have, you're going to have, ongoing projects, um, group presentations, mm -hmm. um, and some might have a final assessment, it might be a research project. So when you look at the five by these assignments, so it's, it's not a matter of intelligence, it's just a matter of time and the, the scale and the level that we required. And um, so it would really, really, really be tough to do it in, in any, shorter, any shorter time frame. Okay. And the question that I anticipated a little earlier, I just did see it, is a, what's the cost of our program? <laughs> and the cost of the program is 50, I'm gonna put it in US dollars simply because that's easier to convert no matter from where you are sitting, no matter where you're joining us from today. So $15,000, 15,000 US dollars is the cost of the program. And um, I'm almost hearing in the back of my, in my head, the butt weight. The 15,000 US, which itself is extremely competitive when you compare it to any other such program of quality anywhere else in the world, that also comes with the resources. What do we mean by resources? You're provided with a laptop as well as the resources for the course. That may be the readings for the course, uh, the, requ the required resources for the course. So they may be an assigned required text. Uh, we usually do that via ebook. Um, especially over the last couple of years. And that is an ebook that is not leased, that is yours to keep once you, once you get the code that is yours to put on your virtual bookshelf and you can retain, you can retain that, um, that text. For some courses, it's readings. So those, the required resources are what is provided for you. So you do get a laptop and of course that's yours to keep and uh, the required resources for that 15,000 US. Sonia, there's, there's another one here that I think, because I know the changes were made recently, the, the, um, the grading scheme. Someone is asking about the grading scheme. Yes, the grading scheme, you are now under the GPA system. Um, you're now under the GPA system. So those who are coming in would be subject to the GPA regulations, uh, having to have a minimum GPA performance every semester to ensure that you can continue onto the program. And we move on a the uh, 4.3 scale. So the A plus is at 4.3 grade points um, from a zero to 4.3 scale. Um, Titania, no, even though we would welcome your $15,000 at the onset, you can certainly pay in installments or you can pay by registration per semester. So the 15,000 and Damien, just correct me because Shelly is asking, and if we have moved the price um, my apologies from 15,000 to 16,000 US. Just confirm that for me. Um, you, would be, you would be paying per your number of credits that you register for. So at the 15,000 with 45 credits, you are registering, you will be about $2,000 per three credit course. So if you do three courses per semester, that will be 6,000 Barbados dollars or right, 6,000 Barbados dollars. Sorry, we're seeing another question come up or um, 3,000 US dollars for the three courses that semester. But we're just gonna double check that I didn't see if we did in, indeed um, move the cost for the upcoming academic year that I'm still 
speaking with the correct numbers. Oh, thank you. Tatayana. 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 Yeah, you'll get it. Someone is butchering it, but we will get it. What what if you're not As working well. in the human resources department? What are the qualifications you will need? Um, this is for much I'm not clear. Is this for a mature student? Because as we said, it is a first degree requirement with a particular um, um, grading degree. If you are somebody with experience, um, the, we consider the experience that you have. And I think you're asking if it's human resources department. What I would say is that it does not necessarily have, if, you're, if it is, the question is related to somebody who does not have a first degree, right? That humor, I, I would put it this way, the practice of managing people, right? Might not, it is not necessarily human resource management. Human resource management is the definitive concept. So what I mean, you might have been, a supervisor of people you might have been a manager hence you're managing people you're recruiting you're training people so you might not have had the title human resource manager or human resource officer but as uh, my colleague Ms. Mahan has said earlier you might have been at a managerial position or supervisory position in which you manage people hence when you do your dossier or cv you can then do a portfolio indicating the involvement in managing people. You were involved in recruitment and deselection decisions. You were involved in making decisions for training and developing staff. You were involved in recommending people for promotion. You were involved in industrial relations issues where somebody might have been disciplined. So all of this adds to the body of knowledge in areas related to the practice of human resource management. And these things will be, will be considered if you are a, a senior uh, mature person not having the formal degree. Well, that and, answers your question. Go ahead. And, it, and therefore, in order for Dr. Corbin and the team to do a complete assessment for you, please set in your application. And that allows us to really Correct. assess Correct. the assess you as an individual rather than just have a general comment on it. So the only way we can do that, uh, yes. depending yes. on uh, your particular circumstance and the nuances that are specific to you, is to see your story. And your story will be told Correct. in your application and your CV especially for your CV as well, if you are non-traditional, if you're not coming in through the traditional academic pathway. So to address Hannah's question, yes, you can enter into a payment plan so that um, typically you would make arrangements with the bursary, depending if you're dealing with the school proper for labor and employment relations or the, you, the university site for a bursary, um, you can schedule your payment so that you're finished the payment for that semester by the end of the semester so for semester one that will be by the end of november and for semester two that will be by the end of march um by the end of april yes as we go into the exam season so you can definitely enter into a payment plan as well and that makes it much more manageable for most rather than having that lump sum at the beginning although if you have the lump sum we certainly will not refuse to you um giving it all up at the beginning of your program. Um, what if you're not into the management field, fresh out of high school? Right, fresh out of high school, we would advise then the BSc, you're, 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 you're one it's step right. above where you have, you're, you're one step above where you need to be. So fresh out of high school, you need to have that grounding. And I try to get back over to you, Dr. Corby. Yes, for sure that the, um, and my colleague is very correct. If you are fresh out of high school, fresh out of college, there's a, an undergraduate degree in human resource management also. And so we would strongly recommend that. And what it does, it, it puts you in a better position to, to perform much better in the masters. And bearing in mind, as you said, folks, the way we market our HRM master's program is our alignment to the international Society for Human Resource Management, which is there geared for practitioners, people are, who are serious about a, a career in HR. And for that, um, you would require a body of experience and knowledge and understanding um, um, if you are serious about a career track, right? And that's why we said that even if you don't have an undergrad degree, we would then look at the body of knowledge and experience that you would bring in managing people. 
even though you might not have a title called human resource management. And um, if you are right out of high school, I would even make a plug for not specializing at the undergrad level. I know this is not popular. Um, Dr. Corbing, I know, I know, I know. And I saw that Dr. Greenish joined us for a little bit. So if he's here, uh, just uh, warm greetings from you, for you, um, from our executive director of the CAFO School of Business, who dropped in a little while ago. I'm not quite sure that he's still <laughs> here, that he's still here with us. But yeah, we have in a terms Right, yeah, but in terms of the undergraduate, one of my favorite programs within the school is the BSc Management Program, which allows you to have the core management courses, and then you can take electives from any of the management subdisciplines that we have in the department. So that if you know you're going to specialize in HR at the master's level, while the some some of our your core courses are going to be in HR, as in any other management degree. You can take the opportunity to explore different areas, maybe marketing, maybe finance, maybe entrepreneurship at the undergrad level, because you're going to get that further experience and specialization in HR at the graduate level. It's not a popular um, train of thought anymore, but that's just something to consider for those who are here and straight so, out of high school. And Sonia, I would say don't forget. Oh, you're still here. Yes. So don't forget that undergrad has now become even more exciting. Whereas it's no longer just a BSc man management studies, but we have our we have our, not a management major, we have we have we have a double major in management. So as Sonia said, you know you can do ten, the ten the ten the ten core courses at the, at the level two and three, and then choose as many courses as you want across management to get to get to get the full feel whether that is going to be in marketing whether that's going to be international business whether it's going to be we because we have really expanded our offerings as well so mm -hmm. so you can grow at that level and then when you get to the graduate level you can you can come and specialize there as well and in response and i see i see it Tonya, the, the, what implications of the choice of options practi practicum research for further postgraduate study it would be more the research. The practicum is, is if you want a career in HR, the practicum is that when you get your master's, you can put on your CV that if you didn't, weren't working in HR, you could argue that you were actually involved in working in a company. And, and as they said, the company also has to do an assessment of you. So you would want to be able to say, I worked in HR and I got an excellent assessment from the, the HR director. But in terms of further postgraduate study, if you're now going, you want to do a, a DBA or want to do the PhD with the, the University of the West Indies, the research component will advise you strongly choose the research project, which mm -hmm. then better prepares you because um, if you're doing a DBA, PhD at that level, it's really a research degree and a, and a rigor. Um, so that would be our, our strong advice for you. If you want to be a practitioner, um, um, you, SHRM is your choice. If you don't have the body of experience not working in HR, the practicum, if you want to be, as they call it, the academic, if you want to be someone who practices HR, but at the same time you want to be an academic, you want to research and publish and add to the body of knowledge um, relevant to the Caribbean and beyond, the research approach. And we also welcome you if you want to register for our PhD or DBA programs, we strongly recommend because as I said before, the university is having a strong push because our international credibility is not only on teaching excellence, but also on research and publication. So we strongly would recommend those persons who might have a flair. And I know that's Dr. Greenish, who is our, our executive head. You know, he has a flair, that's his specialty, research and really high quality research. And I'm sure he would support persons who might be interested also, not only becoming practitioners, but you can be EHR academic practitioner that there's an academic um, focus you can bring. That, that, that is correct. Okay. Uh, I can't, and, and I just want to add to, to what you said again, because you know, you will recall um, for sure the 500 hours. So once you have done the research paper, CERM counts that research paper as that as those 500 practicum hours. I meaning therefore they are seeing that when you go and collect information or you do the in, you do you conduct interviews within the organization, apply some qualitative or qualitative uh, methodology to get information about about HR issue. Yeah. Like 
also engaging from a practical, as you, you call it, academics. You're also engaging the practice of HRM from that perspective, yeah. and 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 therefore you you can then be able to say I have I have my my five or my five hundred hours, or maybe maybe submit your name so you can then go on and do that exam as well. Okay. Um, thanks, Dr. Greenwich, for that, and thanks, um, Dr. Corbin. Just to confirm that it is indeed fifteen thousand US for the for each of the two programs. Um, so no, we haven't moved that to sixteen thousand as yet. What you may have seen before was the MBA or MBA suite is at sixteen thousand US rather than these MSCs that we are highlighting tonight. Um, so, Sonia, I see somebody is asking for a number for contact. In right. So yes. Yeah, so Damien is going to post okay. our, our numbers as well. I think we do have mobile numbers that you can contact us through, and we can also call you. So, Ms. Green, I don't want to butcher the first name. <laughs> Again, if you, if you DM me um, or PM me your contact information, or again, send it to the email address that we are going to repost, we can certainly con contact you with to follow up with any questions that you may have. Just before we wrap up, if you can indicate in the chat which program specifically you're interested in, uh, the MSC HRM or the Labor and Employment Relations, that would be great. And while you're doing that, we are going to shortly post the exit survey. We just want to, we just want you to sort of engage with us a, a little more fully. And that's only going to take about two to three minutes to complete. So if you, you're going to, you're going to put the links in shortly for that exit survey for you to engage with us. So far is the HRM, um, Dr. Corbin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to reiterate, while well, you're still posting that the exit survey and uh, Gloria is labor and employer relations. That's great. Yeah. So it's just that the HRM was easier to type. The characters HRM were easier to type. <laughs> right. Um, and we're seeing persons outside of Barbados. Again, the, the class is a very diverse, can be a very diverse classroom as well, especially at the graduate level. And you're going to be meeting your colleagues from around the region. And indeed, we've had persons as far afield as Europe, um, North America, uh, UK, separate from Europe now, as well within the programs, depending on which program you are pursuing. Africa, HRM, we have Africa. And HRM, I, I was about um, to say, I missed a major region, and that's right, Dr. Greenwich. Yes, Africa from, from uh, she was from Nigeria. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Give me um, I can't tell you remember her name. He, he, he supervised her for, through her practicum. Oh, you mean Andy? Andy. From Nigeria. Andy from Nigeria. Yeah. Yep. Correct. <laughs> in fact, she's still in, we're still in contact, you know, monitoring her career progression all in, the, in Nigeria. Okay, folks. So, so again, so we, um, the I, best value for money that you can have at an accredited university for some of you who've already been with us at the BSc level. So we are looking forward to engaging with you. One more thing that you need to make note of, we do have two entry points for the programs in set, uh, late August, September. Uh, so that application, if you're interested in coming in and we, we really want to see you in, in August, September for the 2022-2023 academic year, you will have to get your application in no later than June 30th, especially for those, but if you have a non-traditional pathway so we can get, so that we don't have a repeat of the lack of communication that Shelly and Marcy see our experiencing, but we're going to follow up with those as well. We want to ensure that we, we have time to get you an answer. So if you're coming from a non-traditional pathway, you're coming from a career into, into academia, back at this level, we want to be able to interview you, to make decisions there, to let you know what's going on as early as possible. So don't wait until June. Even if you're thinking about it, submit the application so we can start the process. We also have an entry point in January and the applications are usually open until once we close off the June applications, applications can then open up for our January intake 
So if you prefer to start at the beginning of the year, that's possible as well. The deadline for that is usually no later than the end of October, but you will see the notifications of that. So Dr. Corbin, Dr. Greenwich, do you have any final words from you since you're still here? No, it was just eavesdropping. <laughs> <laughs> The young people call it lurking, Dr. Okay. Greenwich. I, I learned that term only recently. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so, Dr. Corbin, the final my, words are yours. My and final Damien, words. don't forget to um, post the exit survey in the chat. Yes, we bring a Caribbean flavor with an international context, meaning relevant to the Caribbean but also useful if you wanted to go international. And that's why we were aligning to SHRM. And we also think in, in part of Europe, there's also a, a certification in Europe that Dr. Um, Dr. Greenwich and I discussed that we also want to pursue. But you wouldn't make a wrong decision. Your money would be well invested in choosing the, um, the KFL campus and the KFL School of Business and Management. Thank you for coming in. We really know your time is important. We thank you for taking time to, to come in and then you can contact us and we can get into a little more nitty gritty and details um, of the various programs. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much Bye -bye. for joining us. And again, don't forget to put in your application if you do want to have an assessment of your individual circumstance, put in the application. So we look forward to seeing you in September. We may be seeing some of you in January. Have a good evening. And again, thank you for joining us. And thank you, Hannah. Thank you, all the others that came in. Thank you, Sonia, for your assistance. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Gianni, James. <laughs> I messed that up. Thank you. Sorry, um, uh, Madam James. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Dr. Greenish, for checking in, too. Bye-bye. Have a good evening, folks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.